Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello again, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act 2. As you can see, Art and I are with our favorite movie mogul, historian Manny Pacheco. Manny, great to see you again. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, master of my own fate, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, as always, thoroughly appreciate uh, John stepping on my lines so that I remember how to lead into this stuff. Because <laughs> why don't we... We talked. We, we we a couple of weeks ago were talking about a guy named Thalberg, who I quite frankly had never heard of, nor a lot of other people, but it was a very popular piece, and uh, he was a movie mogul. Uh, we know some of them, like uh, I want Mayer and people like that, uh, but uh, are there more guys like you know who were the movers and shakers? Uh, it, yeah. Some of the famous, some of them not famous, who actually determine whether or not movies ever got made and stars became stars? Were there any, like a lot of people like that that were just really on top of their game? Well, there's a lot, but let me first start by saying you were right, uh, that Irving Thalberg piece, who knew that that was gonna be my our, our most popular interview of this entire uh, Celebrating Act Two segment with, uh, with, with me as your guest. I was very pleased to see the, uh, the number of hits, wow. But to answer your question, Art, uh, yeah, and you know, you can't really have a library or catalog of filmmaking if you don't have the, the studio and all of the, the, the supporting pieces behind it. And it takes a, a movie titan, a movie mogul to, to be able to do that. And the, I mean, let's face it, the idea of being a movie maker or mogul stretches back to the origins of cinema itself. I mean, you had the Lumiere brothers who didn't know how to tell a story, but they sure knew how to put... Uh, celluloid together and, and, and then make sure that it was distributed to audiences across uh, France and then across the United States. And they influenced, of course, another French filmmaker, Georges Méliès, who, of course, um, was able to put together his own studio, sold his his uh, theater that he owned and, and created a, a movie studio before World War One, just about the turn of the century. And uh, for, for like about a decade, he was able to just churn out movie magic that is all but lost because everything was made on nitrate. And of course, nitrate is actually, it, it destructs. Uh, of course, he almost became forgotten uh, because of the war and all of his stuff was, uh, was lost. But a few things remained, especially A Trip to the Moon, which was his most popular piece. But then you get into the, the tried and true era of uh, movie moguldom, and I think it begins with a very familiar name. The uh, first U.S. movie studio was run by Thomas Edison. So Edison owned the first movie studio, and of course it was based uh, in the East Coast, I believe in New Jersey. Uh, and, and, and then a bunch of immigrants uh, from Europe, um, maybe Russia, uh, Eastern Europe, and they came to the United States with the idea of making making movies. Maybe they learned it from Millier. Maybe they just were uh, enamored by the idea and the prospect of working in the United States because they saw some, maybe some U.S. stuff. But everything kind of congregated around the Nickelodeon and then movie palaces that were built on the East Coast. And as, as great as it is to watch a five-cent movie through a Nickelodeon or to go to a movie, Filmmaking on the East Coast can be problematic. And uh, because of the, the problems of weather, you, you can't always work when it's, uh, when it's raining or snowing or it's hazy or it's foggy or whatever. Everything started to move west. And that's where some familiar names emerge. Uh, the, the Niles SNA studio was one of the early uh, movie studios that came out of the, the 1910s. And a, a folk, a folks like Max Sennett ran his own studio up in Fremont, California, which is Northern California, where the, really the first West Coast studio emerged. And uh, Max Sennett is known for, of course, the Sennett Bathing Beauties, the Keystone Cops, and discovering a British actor named Charlie Chaplin. So there was Sennett. And then, of course, there was Cecil B. DeMille, who ended up uh, coming down s south into, uh, you know, a musty little town, Los Angeles. Um, and making his first film called The Squaw Man, and he did it for uh, Adolf Zucker and uh, Paramount Pictures, 
And that was in 19, uh, I want to say it's 1914. It might have been as late as 1916, but it's in the teens. And the Squaw Man was filmed in an area that is now considered Hollywood, right in the area of Hollywood. So from that, you had the Zuckers emerge. Of course, the Lemley family, led by Carl Lemley, and his, uh, fi he founded uh, Universal. Uh, the mayors, of course, uh, along with Samuel Goldwyn, uh, formed MGM. Of course, Goldwyn went off to make his own film company. Uh, and then, of course, the, the Warner Brothers. We had the Brothers Warner. And, of course, uh, eventually run by Jack Warner. But there were, there were a number of brothers, obviously. And then, of course, there were smaller studios that came out of Poverty Row, those little you know stream of studios that just didn't have the... Uh, wherewithal like Fox or Paramount or Universal or MGM. And and then you, the, the most familiar and the biggest was Columbia, and that was run by the uh, real tyrant, uh, uh, Harry Cohn. So those are the most familiar names that I think I can I can bring up. And, and most of them were immigrants. All of them were tough. No nonsense where they could save a buck. They would. Had very little respect for the talent that they signed. And they were all about making movies uh, as a business and that's that's where we where we stand even today you know it's kind of interesting, you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, that um, uh, most of us think of the mogul as uh, somebody uh, not only who green lights it but uh, uh, had the control over the stars under contract uh, decided who they would date who they wouldn't date uh, and they would make all sorts of uh, decisions uh, on behalf of them and uh, so when well, we talked about how these began to get together and the people who ran them, what were some of the, uh, maybe the key aspects uh, uh, of the mogul that I think most of us think of today who ran a studio uh, with a iron fist and could make or break even the biggest uh, stars? Uh, well, you're, you're absolutely right, Art. I mean, they cultivated images. They were, they were the dream machine. They wanted to make sure that their stars led the lives that they dictated, whether they were like that or not. Um, many of them were put together as screen couples, and maybe they didn't even like each other. I think that kind of uh, scenario plays out brilliantly in, in the movie Singing in the Rain. Uh, they didn't get along, but they were the great screen couple. Uh, these, these companies emerged... Make, teaching teaching these the, uh, the the actors to do any number of things on screen. The best at it, obviously, was MGM, where they they could teach their actors to sing. They could teach them to dance and, and understand the concept of choreography. Uh, they would uh, maybe do some uh, 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 facial work. You know, fix they fixed Clark Gable's teeth and his ears. Same thing with Fred Astaire. His ears were pinned back so that they didn't stand out so much. I mean, they did all sorts of, of things that would, you know, that would cultivate a specific screen image for that specific actor. And uh, the other thing I want to mention that they did is that each of the studios kind of um, imagined themselves in, in a certain genre. So, for example, Warner Brothers emerged as the as the place to watch and to actually create gangster films and and swashbucklers so that made stars of people like james cagney and errol flynn uh maybe a george raft or or humphrey bogart universal of course uh, became known for their monster pictures so frankenstein dracula the son of frankenstein the invisible man the mummy and boris karloff and uh and um, uh, bella lugosi emerged as as early stars mgm was known for their big budgets and their musicals so they got these Big, big classic films with lots of stars, of course, that Thalberg thought was important. And then, of course, the musicals that Dory Sherry cultivated. And, of course, the uh, the gritty film noir crime dramas that emerged in the 1940s for 20th Century Fox. That became a real a real big thing. But er, early Fox films um, really were, were, were made popular by the, the screen work of Shirley Temple. RKO, of course, had Astaire and Ginger Rogers, and they had Kate Hepburn. So... I mean, they became known for specific things, and uh, and that was, you know, a decree that was made by the uh, by the movie moguls. You know, uh, Manny, it's it's often been said that they create movie moguls. Some of the names you mentioned really created the industry. Um, and and you're right, they were businessmen, and they they knew how to make a buck. 
you know, even if it involved uh, abusing their performers. Um, but they also had a, a real keen creative sense. Now, they didn't necessarily run the camera or direct the picture or star in it, but all of these moguls had a wonderful creative sense of what the public wanted and you know, was able to was able mm -hmm. to satisfy that, mm -hmm. and that's how they made money. But they also... I, one other thought, and that is that they knew about the distribution. Mm-hmm. And no, that's... No, I, yeah, you're right. You make a great point, by the way. They were real savvy. Remember, they came from the East Coast, you know, in the 19-teens, 1920s. Uh, and so here's the best example of what you're talking about, how they knew how to create filmmaking they they had the stuff that dreams were made of when we went from silence to talkie films talking pictures yeah they knew because of their you know their childhood and their background they knew to to go to the east coast go to broadway and find actors who could emote and 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 could emote to the back row of a broadway stage so they would send their talent scouts to the East Coast to find their actors who would then have to move to the West Coast. And, and I mean, a litany of great actors emerged. Betty Davis, Catherine Hepburn, uh, Clark Gable, um, Lyle Talbot, uh, Alan Jenkins, Spencer Tracy, Pat O'Brien, Humphrey Bogart. These were all out of Broadway, and it's because of the savvy attitudes that these mo moguls knew uh, w what Broadway stood for, that they could find emerging screen talent. And that was, I think that was one of the, the reasons why um, movie making really exploded in the 1930s and the 1940s. Yeah, we, we do owe a lot to these moguls because they had a vision. Now, granted, as you pointed out, it was to make money, but it was to make money by creating a creative product that would entertain people, the business mm -hmm. of entertainment. That's right. And of course, people had been putting on shows, vaudeville and everything else, for, you know, for hundreds of years to make money as entertainers. But these guys took the new technology and made money uh, by making a new form of entertainment. Right. But they did it by glomming, bad word, by, by capturing the values of old entertainment, like Broadway, like books. I can't think of how many That's major right. motion pictures, award-winning, big blockbusters that were made from books. Wizard of mm -hmm. Oz, uh, it's just one of the many well, that come to mind. Books from Hemingway, Steinbeck. Sure. Uh, uh, later, uh, Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams. I think that that's something lacking in today's films. I think we need to see more films that, I mean, Gone with the Wind, Margaret Mitchell, uh, To right. Kill a Mockingbird, of course, yep. came from, uh, you know, Harper Lee. I, I mean, yes, you're right. They knew where to find their uh, material. Yeah, yes. and they, I mean, they, they were good at taking the best of other genres, of, of books, of Broadway, of uh, musicals of mm -hmm. drama, taking the best and making it theirs. And they That's hired right. who's the who's the um, famous writer's wife? His name is Zelda, who uh, wrote for. I'm I'm sorry, I can't. I'm thinking of Zanuck. You're not thinking of Zanuck. Yeah, Daryl Zanuck? Not not Zelda Zanuck. No. No. Uh, anyway, famous author mm -hmm. who went to work for Hollywood and hated it. Oh yeah, and a lot of them did. And in, yeah. in fact, it's it's captured brilliantly in uh, in that great movie from 1952 with Kirk Douglas, The Bad and the Beautiful, uh, where 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 Dick Powell plays the writer that just hates Hollywood but loves to write. Yeah. And there were a lot of uh, uh, screenplay writers that were actually novelists. Uh, Raymond Chandler is a great one that comes to mind. So yeah, I mean. I, it's it's amazing how they could draw upon every creative aspect to make their movies, I mean, just about perfect in many ways. I mean, you look at some of these movies, and, and it's, it's amazing when you hear people like Scorsese, um, and they say, how did they do that? How did they create King Kong? How did they film those wonderful scenes in, in, in Wings? I mean, it, it took 
the, it took the brainchild of the talent that they had to assemble, and it took the movie moguls, the um, they had to work hard to assemble just the right people for the right project. Yeah. And I will tell you, they really ran with an iron fist. I don't know if I've ever shared this story, but it's one of my favorite stories to tell. Clark Gable, of course, had uh, had a string of hits and all of a sudden became known as the king of Hollywood. But he surely wasn't the king of MGM because he made the mistake of going into Louis B. Mayer's office, who then was the mogul uh, for MGM, and asked for a raise in 1934. And Louis B. Mayer simply responded. First of all, he never called him by his first name, which is very, very dismissive. But he said, OK, Gable, here's what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to lend you out to Columbia Pictures. Remember Poverty Row? And you can make a picture there uh, mm -hmm. for, a, for a director that's up and coming named Capra. And, um, but you're going to get half the money you normally make. Maybe then you'll appreciate the money you make here at MGM. Mm -hmm. But don't feel too bad about uh, Gable because he went there, uh, actually performed with Claudette Colbert, and it happened one night. And it's the only Oscar that Clark Gable ever won. <laughs> <laughs> so... It kind of backfired on Mayer, but you know, he never got that raise, and he was never considered a fa favorite by Louis B. Mayer. And uh, wow. he was always known as Gable. And that's a a very By the way, F. Scott Fitzgerald is the name. Oh, of yeah, yeah, yeah. F. Scott mm. Fitzgerald, of course. Yeah. Of course. But, I, yeah. By, by the way, so, Manny, as always, having conversations with you, uh, particularly about old, old Hollywood, are fascinating because you, you know so much and bring it to the table. Uh, but I have to tell you that. I was a little disappointed, and I'm going to ask that we come back and continue this maybe in part two, because in Moguls, I was thinking you were going to talk about all the scummy things they did, because that's what they sort of have a reputation for, and you only slightly touched on it. Uh, well, so I, 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 don't think we should, I don't think we should do it here. It, it deserves, no, no. Its, own, it deserves but, its own episode. But, but I can offer a teaser. Uh, and, well, you know, yeah, but the only thing is I will say that what I was thinking is many of the things that they are purported and and reported to have done would probably have put them in a jail cell today. No, <laughs> well, I, I don't have anything that's I don't have anything that's scummy. But I, I mean, they all worked together to make TV a flop. I mean, they really they really uh, commingled amongst themselves, just m much like the way the NFL owners kind of commingled. And they really worked hard at uh, making sure that TV would 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 fail. Now, they 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 failed. And uh, there was there's plenty of reasons why they failed. Obviously, I Love Lucy, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, the shot heard round the world between the Giants and the Dodgers, the 1952 presidential election. All of that worked against the filmmakers and moguls, and uh, it, it, they should not have su succeeded in trying to make television fail. It, it should have succeeded. But one of the things that they actually did is they kept the Oscars off television until about 1956. So they at least succeeded in that respect, but uh, yeah, they were they could be they could be very mean and underhanded when they wanted to be. This has been great, Manny. Love love this uh, view of history, and uh, I think we owe those moguls uh, quite a, a bit of uh, thanks. I agree. I think that they are um, they are special uh, folks. That you had mentioned that maybe they're not. Uh, known, but I think most of them are pretty familiar and uh, they have a special place in Hollywood history. Great. Well, thank you again, Manny, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. You got it. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.